What's up, everybody? I'm Emily. I'm Julia. And welcome to the Therapy Sessions podcast, where we discuss all things art and how they make us feel. Each session, we'll sit down with an artist whose work heals or inspires us and confabulate on art as a catharsis for both the consumer and the creator. This week's guest is Harrison Whitford. We'll be discussing his debut album titled Afraid of Everything, as well as his tour with Phoebe Bridgers, the concept of fear, and much, much more. Got a lover, got a friend, got a dream and a place to live. Got a mother, got a dad, got a feeling that's kind of bad. I'm just scared sometimes. Bad day maybe cost my mind. Now nothing ever seems real enough to not be a dream. Space out. Late night, stomach turns and my chest feels tight. Can't breathe, can't speak. Thank you so much for talking to us. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I uh, just rolled into Charlottesville and I have nothing really to do. That's not the reason I'm talking to you guys. (laughs) Coincidentally, I have nothing to do. No worries. Well, that worked out well. We're in the same boat. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so we'll dive in by taking it all the way back. So what first got you interested in music and was kind of the point that you realized that you wanted to and you could pursue this as a passion and a career? Um, That's a good question. Probably, I I didn't really have a super strong interest in it when I was <clears throat> really young. Um, but around the age of 12, um, my brother was is a musician and was mm-hmm. playing guitar and I think some sort of natural inclination to want to be like your older brother or something like that mm-hmm. played into... Uh, me wanting a guitar or wanting a bass rather I started on the bass yeah and then and uh and then my friends in high school were doing some performance and they had this sort of quasi band put together but someone already played bass and uh they what a rarity I know right yeah so they they, they, yeah what a rarity indeed What, what do you guys play by the way we both just play guitar. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Want to expand our instrument repertoire? Yeah. Well, there's never enough bass players. But <laughs> they 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 basically forced me to play guitar. Um. So I ended up getting a guitar and performing really quickly after that. And I think I just sort of um fell in love with it really immediately but then I do remember having a moment after playing for about like six months and seeing some some footage of a performance I had done with some friends and feeling really dark on it like really hypercritical about it and I remember having this conversation with myself and I think I was 13 or almost 13 and and um like sort of consulting with myself as to whether I'd wake up the next day and be like, okay, I'm abandoning the guitar and music, and I'm going to do something else, or I'm going to like practice twice as much as I already do. Um, and I ended up going with the latter. I don't think at that point I, it was a choice as much as it was just felt natural to do that. Mm. Um, but, and yeah, I mean, I still, it's funny because... I think it's sort of what makes playing music like a really beautiful thing is is, um, having a moment like that and then like flash forward 11 years and you've come a really long way but you're constantly having those moments like every day you know you don't really arrive at some place or if you do then you have to figure out a way to 
uh, go further, I guess. I don't know. I feel like the conversations you were having with yourself at 13 are like the conversations that we're having with ourselves right now, like in our 20s, being yeah. like, can we do this? Should we do this? God, I sound right. like well, shit. Well, right? Yeah, I mean, I still don't know if I can do it. I ended up doing it enough yeah. where now I'm. there's kind of no – I kind of really – messed up because now I don't have any other life skills. I, I, it's, for me, it's just sort of a it's what you dig gotta, myself yeah. further into this own whole kind of situation. But So how many instruments do you play? Um, well, I mean, I consider myself a guitar player, first and foremost. I guess, you know, I think I could sort of make music on any instrument, but I think guitar feels like the only thing that I understand um i mean i I like you know i'll use the piano as like a writing tool but i am by no means a piano player or something like that i play lap steel but that's sort of to me just like a horizontal guitar Guitar. (laughs) so i guess i don't know i saw it was funny because i saw somebody some like concert review i play with my friend phoebe bridgers and uh i saw some concert review of where it mentioned my name and it was like, oh, multi-instrumentalist Harrison Whitford. <laughs> and that's literally just because I switched between guitar and lap steel, which it feels really silly to be called that. I think of like a guy who's playing drums and keys and, you know, doing a thousand things that better than I could ever do. So, so yeah, I guess I only play one instrument, really. <laughs> nice, nice. It's all right. So do we. <laughs> we feel yeah. So you mentioned that you're touring with Phoebe. How is that? Uh, it's great. It's awesome. Phoebe's I mean I've been playing I've known Phoebe for about six years and we've been sort of playing off and on in some capacity for all that time but the past I guess year and a half have been just her solo shows uh you know sometimes just the two of us or like now there's a band with her so that's been really fun Mm -hmm. but it's great Phoebe's songs are amazing um I feel like uh it's just cool to be playing shows that people are coming to and are familiar with the record and um like they're singing the words and I had this moment with it last night where like I felt really tired at the show last night and kind of um was struggling to uh how do I say this, like reach whatever, you know, magic you try to reach when right. you play live, I guess. And, you know, somebody in the audience that I was talking to after was like, oh, we drove 12 hours from Miami to see this show. Oh, and I awesome. thought that was amazing. It made me feel really bad. I was like, no excuse to not ever totally be in it. Like some dude might, I would never drive 12 hours voluntarily. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's like that's true. commitment. That is, yeah, that is true commitment for yeah. sure. Do you have like a favorite moment from the tour so far? You know, a favorite memory or anything? Hmm. I liked um, our show in Nashville. I thought that went really well. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any memory worth sharing. Um, <laughs> I guess that show was really good. That yeah. that feels like a good memory when I think about it. Where did you play um, in Nash? Uh, the Cannery Ballroom. That's awesome. Do you think that touring yeah. with friends is like different than touring with a regular band? Strangers. Yeah. Uh, I definitely think it's ideal. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that the like hang aspect of a tour is as important as the music, even just because. You know, like when you're placed in a setting where everything's an obstacle, to have people that you can sort of relate to on any level, I think, alleviates whatever pressure there might be behind that challenge, you know, as opposed to, I don't know. And it's always good when there's like a really positive person in the group. Our keyboard player, Nick, is this sort of relentlessly positive guy. Good. And, oh, that's uh, you need that. That's, that like uplifting yeah, no, kind of. Really we can make it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Somebody to drown out the cynicism and negativity <laughs> that occasionally flares up. Were you recording your record while you were on the road? Um, trying to think. When did I start my record? Kind of. Okay. I think I had just gotten off the road with Phoebe. I'd been talking to Marshall for probably like a year about 
wanting to make an album, I, I, I'd been sort of writing a bunch of songs since I had turned 16 um, and for years and then met Marshall and like flash forward two years, we started working on it at the end of August in 2016. And we only had like three days to start the thing. So we did like all the really important stuff in three days, which was kind of crazy. And then him and I went to work on a separate record together, um, like just to be musicians on, just to play on. And so it was kind of funny because I wasn't on the road, but we ended up both being really busy with stuff. So it was like we did three days at this like really furious pace recording and then six months of sort of scattered overdubs and then yeah and then and then the record was finished by like may of last year and i just wasn't sure what i was going to do with it and then i ended up being on tour all year and um yeah i don't know why i waited so long exactly but it was good to have it out finally. It was definitely worth the wait. It's really great. And Thank you. Yeah. And we picked up some like Bob Dylan, Elliot Smith vibes. Ryan Adams. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. We, yeah. I was just wondering who had your ear at the moment when you were you know, mm. writing or recording. Well, those, those two guys I'm definitely listening to all the time and have been since I was like 12, Dylan and Elliot. But I think at the time I was listening to the replacements record tim a lot um i was feeling really inspired by julian baker who we've played some shows with with phoebe nice yeah i love her yes, she's, <laughs> yeah she's, she's amazing yes and uh i'm trying to log my memory to think of what i was listening to i mean it's funny because all those songs were written like over the course of probably like four years some songs are from when i was like 17 and some were from like but one of the songs on the record was from the night before we went in to make the record. Which one Which was song? that? Uh, Don't Want Out. Nice. Um, Good one. It's like the fourth track or something. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so probably, uh, yeah, you know, Elliot Smith and Dylan are very fair assessments. Those are just two superheroes of mine well you did them proud yes yeah. well thank you of course i i don't want bob dylan to ever hear my music <laughs> i feel like he's a really scary guy i feel like everyone feels that yeah. way because you yeah, just he's would live in fear man. of what he would say even the beatles yeah. were scared of him so i mean yeah i think his kids are scared of yeah. him can you imagine having that much power over like the over musical the, community right it's like, so horrible it's <laughs> It's too much. It's too much power. Seriously, it is. It is. <laughs> but genius, though. Oh yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So, what would you say is your approach to songwriting, or your like creative process like? Um, that's a good question. It's kind of different every time, but it usually starts where I generally won't finish a song if it's too hard to finish. If that makes sense. If it's just too much of an effort, like. You know, I respect Phoebe a lot because she'll spend, like, six months on a song just making, like, every lyric and moment feel sort of airtight. Um, I'll spend a week at most on a song. But, I mean, every song on that record was, for the most part, written pretty fast. I had gotten an idea, like a melody or a lyric or something, and then the song just sort of happened. But I don't know, it feels different every time. I think it's important to, uh, I think it's important to like pay attention to, this sounds sort of like silly and um, overly conceptual, but like pay attention to what the song feels like it wants mm -hmm. as you're writing it, you know? And then Mar Marshall was helpful as a producer because he, I think, was able to identify which songs of mine felt the most original or something like that. And that's not to say that a lot of them aren't derivative in some ways, but, you know, I think there's the whole point of art is not to, is to sort of say an old thing in a new way, you know? But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it changes, like, 
lately I've just been writing on, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with those teenage engineering OP1s. Have you ever seen those? No. no. There are these portable um, little synthesizers, but they have like a four track recorder in them. And you can like plug a guitar into them or like plug records in and sample them. Kind of lately just been writing on that, like just instrumental stuff. And that's kind of been nice. It's a way to write on the road. I was going to um, say, can you like plug it into a computer or something too? Like, does it Yeah, yeah, you stuff? can like drop it into a session and flesh it out and do yes. all that. I know like for me, I grapple with a terrible tendency to like over edit things to death. And uh-huh. <laughs> so when did you kind of hit the point when you decided like this is done and it felt totally complete and polished and those were the exact nine songs that you wanted to put out there for this? Um, man, I don't know that I really did. I think, I think that, um, a huge part of it for me was just straight up letting go of it. Marshall and I mixed the record ourselves. So we were, aside from mastering quite literally, like surgically, um, a part of every process of it. So for me, I went from literally writing it to deciding exactly how it's going to sound on the computer, on the like fucking pro tool session. And, uh, I, I don't think I ever really felt that way. I mean, if you saw my hard drive, you would see that there's like five different folders of like final album uploads, actual final album uploads, <laughs> like, like it's literally awesome. these are the real album uploads. Like, <laughs> I couldn't, I'm not kidding this time. Yeah. I, you know, which I think, um, I don't know. I don't know if everybody struggles with that, but, but I really do think a large part of it is, is letting go. I mean, I think too, with those songs, it's like, yeah, if I, if I listen to them or think about them, there's there's things I would change, but I'm gonna, you know, hopefully write more, and that that happened, and and it's not to say by saying that there's things I would change about things that I've done, it's not to say that I didn't put like the utmost amount of effort into it, but I think it's just natural to feel that. Like anything you created is not, it, it's going to be a mutation of the idea you had, you know, like, like it's really difficult to, to, to create anything that's like an absolutely transparent translation of an idea you had. That's almost impossible. That's kind of, to me, what makes any sort of art special because it's, it's not a perfect, uh, perfectly executed vision. If you can get it really, really close, like that's mm-hmm. kind of a remarkable thing, you know. I mean, then there are people like David Lynch and stuff who make movies that feel like feel like an idea. So I don't know. I guess I don't know, man. It's a struggle. Mm-hmm. I would say letting go is important. Yeah, you can't overthink. Relinquishing it control. Yeah, right. overthinking is really bad yeah but but it's all it's all easier said than done definitely well I mean I know from our perspective we definitely feel like it is absolutely wonderfully complete from head to toe I remember I was at work and I like found the record on Spotify and I started listening to it and I texted Julia and I was like get ready I just found the best saddest album ever (laughs) and we were truly inert on the floor like weeping over it it was amazing it was awesome I'm really sorry oh no no, it was great for us that's the best Friday night ever (laughs) damn your guys Friday night sounds a lot like mine usually (laughs) the beginning of a beautiful friendship yeah Yeah. If you um, know of any really new sad records, you should tell me too. Ooh, I'm like sure. I'm like dying for a new thing to be listening to. Uh, have you ever heard of uh, Kate Francis? No. He's really good. He just put out an album um, a couple of months ago, um, but from top to toe, like it, the songs are just really really good. I think you probably Great. Think his song. I love that. Also, I it's. Her like EP is pretty old, but many rooms, the hollow yes. body. Yeah. Many rooms. I I feel like that sounds really familiar, but yeah. I, I don't think I've heard that. It's like 
hauntingly beautiful. Really, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'll um, listen to that too. That's awesome. Yeah. But so, I mean, how does it feel to have this album, this thing that like didn't exist and now it does because you created it kind of out in the ether for everybody to consume? Uh, it feels good. I mean, it, it definitely feels like, uh, you know, I don't know. It's hard to define because I think like with anything, you have an idea of what it will feel like and it never quite is that. I think for me anyways, like making a, that record or working on new stuff is ultimately where like the source of my joy comes from. So it, it, it I think a lot of it was like, oh, I'm gonna, it's gonna feel so good to finally have a record out or it's gonna feel like different or some way. And, you know, it feels good. It doesn't necessarily feel any different. It's kind of reaffirming that, um, like the making of the thing is, is what's important to me. Like just, just physically working on it is always going to be more fun than, than sharing it. But it is, it is fun to share it. And it's fun when, you know, to know that it like connects with people or helps them with something, I guess. I guess that's why I like records because they help me with something. Absolutely. So. Yeah, it's therapeutic, right. you know. Yeah. Was there any song that was like particularly difficult for you to finish either like from a technical standpoint or an emotional standpoint on the record? Um, trying to think of what, which one that might have been. Just take a walk, both my friends, pair of lungs. Um, I don't know about finishing, but I remember like pair of lungs was really hard to record. Um, that song is kind of at the top of my range vocally. It does and sound I, like extremely emotionally earnest. That to me was one of the ones on the record that stood out as sonically I, different from the rest. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one was hard to record. Marshall had me do a lot of takes of that song, and I, th- I think like I at that point of um, like where I was at during the making of the record and like what it, whatever else was going on in my life emotionally, I was kind of a pile of mush at that point. So it was it was just like one of those things where by like the fifth take, I was just sort of getting angrier and more upset recording it and I don't even I don't remember which take the you know final version is but I guess that one was hard to I can't think of which song on there might have been hard to finish um like as a song but that one was hard to record Mm. I think Poltergeist Love was kind of hard to finish actually that was a that lyric is like so that lyric is, a, it's a Connor Oberst lyric. And uh, I had been listening to a song of his that that lyric's in, and I wanted to write like a whole song around it. And so I spent basically like a week and a half doing that and, you know, writing a bunch of different verses and finally arriving at a thing that I like. Poltergeist Love is one of my absolute favorites off the record. So. Well, thank you. Yeah, it came out incredible. I kind of prefer to listen to albums on vinyl as opposed to streaming them just so yeah. that temptation to kind of like skip around is removed um, totally i was thinking about this today yeah it just allows you to like hear the album as the way that the artist intended for it to be heard totally so i was wondering is there like a particular reason you put the songs in the order the way that you did oh like how i sequenced them yeah um well we had been playing with a bunch of different sequences and then we got like a second round of masters from our mastering guy and the uh like the folder that he sent them in happened to play out in the sequence that's on the record and marshall and i both really liked this sort of digitally coincidental sequence it's literally just the way they got sent to us in the second round of masters after we'd sort of messed around with you know, like various permutations of, I think at one point, part-time heart was first and not last, or don't want out was first, or, you know, like all sorts of random things. And then, yeah, we just liked the way that random sequence felt. Yeah, it felt like it came out, because to me it almost felt intentional, because you start out with, the album is called Afraid of Everything, and then you start with Take a Walk, um, which right, kind of, right. which kind of feels like you know you're kind of taking us. <laughs> you're like I um, need a minute. For yeah, everything. and the whole album builds to 
uh, part time heart, and it just kind of feels like just interesting because it talks about like a like dead, dead end street, street you it's know, like, burning away, and it's yeah. just kind of like that final. That's so funny. I've I actually never have noticed that myself. That's <laughs> cool. I'm I'm. That's so funny. Yeah. Well. Yeah, I feel man, like thanks I for making that observation. You. Yeah, of course. Yeah, just a, just a little anxious stroll, you know? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, the only guy. But I, I agree, though, I like to listen to records on vinyl because even when I'm sitting in the van, like today, it's it takes a lot of discipline to not be like, skip to a new song or something or go to a whole other record. I think digital stuff, too, like after a while, will sort of... Um, fatigue my ears a little bit hopefully in the future i'll get be able to get final made for it were there any songs you had to kind of cut out that you wanted to put on the album yeah there was a song on there called a song that i still really love called whatever keeps me from you Mm -hmm. and there was like a there's like a a demo of it that i had done on this cassette machine I have that was really like this very quiet acoustic thing with some like sparse drums and guitar and then Marshall and I had gotten this idea that we were going to sort of turn it into like this replacement song make it basically a rock song and we were mixing the record we were really struggling to like get a mix of it that we liked realized the glaring issue was that it just didn't fit at all with the other songs and while we were mixing i had written on um phoebe's like childhood piano that song strangers in the making Mm -hmm. i had written that and then marshall had the idea that we should just go record that at our friend tony's house which is where we did phoebe's record and uh yeah so that so yeah that song replaced the quasi replacement that i don't miss the recording but i miss the song yeah so maybe on the next record all right we gotta talk about the album artwork is that you oh, yeah. in the picture yes so why that photo um i my friend brian de Leon, who's a really talented drummer and has played with phoebe and i before he like really liked that photo and i had sort of randomly put it on this uh, sound cl- this like private sound cloud link when we were uh, trying to test out sequences for the record and he was like dude you should just make that the album cover and I, I at that point like at that juncture I had been trying to come up with album artwork like photos or illustrations and nothing felt fitting and, and something about that photo felt really fitting to me for some reason yeah i mean it's like this hilarious paradox of looking at this kid with like a crown on his head and it's like purportedly his birthday and feeling like takes you back to that like youthful feeling that you literally are like king of the world you can do anything and then to call the album afraid of everything it was just like so genius i was like this is amazing that's so funny I, I i didn't even think of it in that way but i mean it is interesting because like take a walk is sort of about um this really horrible experience i had on my birthday uh, and and so now that i think about the album cover that is really kind of ridiculous <laughs> See, it all comes together it all fit yeah nothing is you, unintentional yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you guys have noticed, like, a lot of through lines about my life that I have not even <laughs> discovered myself. Honestly, it's fun. all we do is yeah. sit here and, like, dissect <laughs> records and, like... That's awesome. That's so fucking cool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Good time. Yeah, I mean, so, I guess, would you say, like, when you were a kid, like, looking back on that time, would you say that you were more afraid of everything then? Or are you more afraid of it now? And do you even think huh? that fear is something that can pass or do we just kind of develop better coping mechanisms? I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, I think like, um, I think Mandela or somebody said that fear is the thing that we conquer. Um, but I definitely feel like I have memories from around the age that that photo was taken where, you know, I, I almost feel like the same person then and not in a way that I mean, I haven't grown since I was a literal child, but, you know, I think there's parts of you that uh, will remain intact sometimes, and and 
to me, those always end up being the parts that play into how you express yourself. I mean, at the end of the day, like when I was that age, I was just as interested in, um, like illustrating as I am now about playing guitar. And for me, that's just a different set of colors. It's still an outlet. So I don't know. I mean, there's, I don't know, fear's a big, it's a big thing, but like obviously there are people around the world who have endured and encountered like just horrible atrocities and even conquered that and made it on the other side of that. Um, so I don't know. I think that's a, that's a tough question to yeah, answer. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, what do you guys think? I mean, I guess it's that thing where I feel like fear doesn't exist until you fail and then you learn that you have to fear things because when you're a kid, you have no idea of your own mortality or anything. So nothing to you yeah. is frightening beyond the tangible, like, spiders and things like that. But then, totally, you know, as you mature, obviously, like, the fear takes a way less tangible form and it becomes kind of this awful, amorphous thing that just permeates all aspects of your life I think without you really knowing it and so it's I think you're it's kind of what you were saying about those parts of you still exist they just totally manifest themselves into a different form that you know is probably you probably deal with in kind of the same way but still just really challenging well it sounds like what you're saying to me too which I think is a really fascinating perspective is like it's maybe important even to have certain experiences that remind you that you're not invincible or remind you of your mortality because, you know, then you can actually impart something that really feels meaningful. Otherwise, I guess it all, it it is all just sort of spiders and shit. (laughs) Spiders and the dark. The name of your second album, (laughs) Spiders Spiders and and Shit. shit. Like yeah, alliteration spi- oh, too. Shit, dude, that's so good. <laughs> I'm take I'm using that. Absolutely. <laughs> Spiders and shit. I didn't, I didn't think I'd get a new album title out of this. I mean, hey, it's <laughs> we're, we're here to help in any way, you know. <laughs> Thank you. So, what would you say was one of the biggest fears that you had to overcome in order to get to this point as a musician? Hmm. Um. I mean, I still am, I'm still every night, like when I play, try to get past the fear of thinking too much or having anxiety about what the next moment is. You know, I think art and music is a game of like total presence and not, um, not betraying yourself for the sake of playing it safe. I think it's important to just do what you feel and not be afraid of whatever that risk is because if it doesn't land you're twice as likely to make it land the next time you know but you never would have been even close the next time if you didn't try Mm -hmm. i think a lot of it is not being afraid of like failure whether it's like oh i'm not going to be able to play this melody i'm feeling or like what if this song doesn't turn out how i want it to like i think just ignoring all of that or at the very very least like analyzing that to the point of its own extinction you know because sometimes we just like build stuff up in our minds you know and we're kind of our own worst enemy yeah Yeah. totally totally yeah i think that's like i think that's the trickiest thing about making anything it's like the doubt that you'll inevitably feel or or, um you know I, i think it's good to be hypercritical of yourself, but not at the expense of not making anything at all. Because you'll always feel that way anyways. Right. And then if, you know, if you never put anything out or, like, put yourself out, then you'll never know. You know, you'll always just be living Yeah, in fear. you always just wonder. And that'll actually make you insane. Right. Yeah. True. <laughs> of course, there's ways to make yourself <laughs> that be a song like, on at any given shit. moment, though. Yeah, that's that's definitely uh, the t- the first track on yeah, Spiders and Shit. Spiders and Shit. I'll I'll give you guys some royalties. Oh, okay. amazing! Peace for that. So don't worry. Feel better, feel worse. Old gum at the bottom of a purse. Fish hook for a heart. 
can't catch when it's only caught I'm just scared sometimes that day maybe cost my mind now nothing ever seems real enough all right so I'm gonna ask you our top 10 favorite questions to ask any artist so, all right here we go all right so what is the song that's most therapeutic for you to listen to when you find yourself in a state of either external or internal chaos? Can I pick a couple? Yes. Um, Easy Way Out by Elliot Smith is a, is a really good one um, that I like to listen to when I'm sad. Uh, I really like to listen to all of George Harrison's Living in the Material World. That record makes me feel really good. And uh, um, what else? Um, Santo and Johnny Sleepwalk. That song makes me feel really good. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy with those. What's the one song you wish you wrote? Mm. That's a really good question. I think God by John Lennon is a pretty perfect song, but I couldn't have written that unless I was a Beatle. Maybe like a change is gonna come. By that, like this, you know, Sam Cooke classic, classic tune. Classic that kind of yeah. feels like a perfect song to me. If you could score the soundtrack for any book, what book would you choose? Oh my God! Great question. Maybe either Tropic of Cancer by Henry Miller, mm-hmm. or um, The Wind Up Bird Chronicle. I don't know if you've read that no, Murakami no. book. That seems like that would be a really fun, dreamy thing to score. Yeah, let's go with that. All right. To add that to my reading list. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. What is the band or album that you feel is criminally underrated? There's this band Coma Cinema I like a lot, and they have... Oh. Yeah, they they have a following. Like, they're not... I wouldn't say they're underrated but i think in comparison to other stuff they're underrated i think i literally think i just randomly have one of their songs that i found through like my discover weekly like partners in crime oh yeah yeah that song's so good yeah uh, yeah um yeah i think that guy's an amazing songwriter yeah what is your favorite thing to do when you are not writing or playing music or listening to music (laughs) um either uh drawing or like probably looking at memes. <laughs> um, Same. <laughs> They're so Yeah. <laughs> We're just all looking for the meaning in life, you know? I know. I know. <laughs> <That's>, wow. <laughs> that was all. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Apology accepted. <laughs> <laughs> if you can live in a musical decade besides this one, what musical decade would you want to live in? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I guess like the like either the late like the late fifties, very early sixties, yeah, or the late sixties, very early seventies. Yeah, yeah. That's a sweet spot. Um, what would you be doing career wise if you weren't playing music? <laughs> Which is going to be challenging based off of one of your previous answers. Yeah, I I literally have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. That's sad. I I wish there was an answer, but yeah. I maybe I don't know. That's how you know that you're definitely doing the right thing when you don't even leave yourself any other option, right? But what you're doing, like that's amazing. Exactly. Or it's how you know you made like a bunch of really dumb mistakes. <laughs> but but I like your perspective too. <laughs> we'll hope for the latter, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What is your dream venue to play at? Ooh. Um. Something about, like, uh, seeing shows. Uh, I grew up in New York, and something about seeing shows at the Beacon was always really cool. I think it would be awesome to play the Beacon. What is favorite lyric of yours from the album? From the album? Yes. Oh, man. I like the second verse of Take a Walk, the old gum at the bottom of a purse lyric. I don't know why. I just like the way that feels when I sing it. Awesome imagery. Yeah, that's really good. And what advice would you give to struggling musicians or, you know, musicians trying to break into the music industry, trying to make it as a career kind of thing? Um, probably just to, like, 
make sure you really love it and and be nice be really nice to everyone be a good be a good person right. yeah well you get back what you put out uh, so, totally yeah yeah, yeah. It goes full circle you know all right well i think that about wraps up everything that we wanted to ask you so um awesome. but was there anything else you wanted to add about the record or anything that we didn't really get to touch upon uh, I just want to say that if anybody's listening, they should probably follow at Marshall Vaughn on Instagram. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. Any particular all, reason? or? <laughs> I mean, you'll find out eventually, but yeah, that's you it. You heard it here first. All right, well, where can everybody access your album? Um, well, it's on. It's currently on Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music and all that stuff. Um, like I said, hopefully sooner than later there will be physical copies but um yeah on the on the uh, world wide web <laughs> <Lovely>. <laughs> all right with spiders yeah. and shit um, yeah with spiders but yeah you can see that late fall 2019 <laughs> me on the lookout Hurting spiders your and face. shit volume one. <laughs> oh, what if it was vo- spiders and shit volume one you know but spiders and shit volume two never fu- never comes out <laughs> no it'll be like cockroaches and crap right like, yeah <laughs> yeah yeah Keep the, Keep the like, bug theme are, going, you know? Them. I'm going to call you guys anytime I need a, a title for something. Awesome. Amazing. Sounds good. For. All right. Well, thank you so much for talking Yeah, thanks with us. for having me. Yeah, it's been awesome. You know, it's super insightful for us to be able to pick the brain of somebody that we really respect in the industry that's, you know, actively a part of it. So thank you so much for that. So well, thank you. This was really fun. Well, you burn like rain or cigarette or a match like all those things you burn away. And you and my brain chemicals all aflame and I'm at your feet again anyways. It's never dark outside and you want it to be. And the cold wouldn't come if you were begging to freeze Any lover that shows is a lover that bleeds All right, so that was our interview with Harrison Whitford. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, Definitely check out his album. It's on iTunes, Spotify, all the regular forums. Definitely give it a listen. We'll post in the links in the bio for you guys. And be sure to check him out on tour with Phoebe Bridgers. Those tour dates are on his Instagram. You can follow him at Scarrison Whitford. So if you guys liked what you heard, feel free to give us a like, give us a follow. We are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. The handle is at Therapy Sessions Podcast. And tune in to the next session. We'll see you guys then.